For part one of chapter seven, we're going to explore atoms, elements, and moles. Let's start by defining matter. So what is matter made of? In ancient Greece, they thought there were just four Greek elements, earth, fire, wind, and water. But in 1661, Robert Boyle came along and proved through experimentation that there were actually many, many more elements than ancient Greece originally predicted. Today, elements are defined as substances that cannot be broken down any further by chemical means. Each element on the periodic table is composed of atoms that have the same atomic number. Democritus actually took it in a slightly different direction. Instead of focusing on the elements, he focused on the ultimate components of all substances. Now this ultimate component he coined as the atom, which is Greek for atomus, which means uncuttable or indivisible. So what an atom is, is it's the smallest particle of an element that retains the properties of that element. So elements are essentially made up of atoms. John Dalton came along and devised the first modern atomic theory, which we'll look at next. The first modern atomic theory had five main postulates that we're going to cover. The first two postulates later proved not to be entirely true, and we'll look more closely at that when the time comes. The very first postulate is that elements consist of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. So it's true that elements consist of tiny particles called atoms, but what we'll see is that it's not true that atoms are indivisible. For number two, all atoms of an element are identical. Now identical is a strong word. All atoms of an element are very similar. For instance, we'll see that they have the same atomic number, but they can differ in other ways. So that's why number two isn't entirely true anymore. However, these were true at the time um, that John Dalton came up with this theory. For number three, a particular element's atoms are different from another element's atoms. That's true. Carbon atoms would be different from oxygen atoms. Still proven true today. For number four, compounds consist of different atomic elements combined. That's just the definition of a compound. If you have two or more elements forming a bond of some sort, it's going to be classified as a compound. The examples shown below are sodium chloride, where we have sodium forming a bond with chlorine, and then of course water, where we have hydrogen and oxygen atoms combining. Number five, atoms are neither created or destroyed during a chemical reaction, but rearranged. Um, and we'll see this when we start balancing chemical equations. So it's just like with energy as well. Energy is not created or destroyed, it's just transformed. Same goes for atoms in chemical reactions. So let's look at rule one and why it has been disproved. So what's true about the first postulate is that elements are composed of atoms that have the same atomic number. That's still proven true. What's also still true is that atoms are the smallest particle of an element that retain the properties of that element. The false part of that postulate is that atoms are indivisible particles. That is not true. Atoms are not indivisible particles. We can actually split atoms now uh, with technology that we've learned. Let's look at the composition of an atom. So atoms consist of three subatomic particles. They're called subatomic particles because they are the three particles that make up the atom. We have a proton, a neutron and an electron. Now protons are positively charged particles. Neutrons are neutral, hence the name neutron, which means they do not have a charge or a charge of zero, you could say. And then electrons are gonna be the negatively charged particles. So where are these subatomic particles in an atom? Well, Ernest Rutherford did some studies, some experiments to discover the structure of an atom. And what he found with, through his experiments were that the volume occupied by an atom consists of a large amount of empty space, which we let, later find out that this is actually the electron cloud. Then there is a small positively charged center that has most of the mass 
of the atom. This center is called the nucleus. Now, to put this a little bit in perspective, when we talk about the nucleus versus this large electron cloud, the nucleus would be the size of a blueberry and the electron cloud around it, that empty space um, that he's talking about, would be the size of a football field. So here are two depictions of atoms. We can see the center, that nucleus, the blueberry we were just talking about, in both. So in the picture off to the left, we have just a red center being the nucleus. Over in the picture to the right, the nucleus is the center still, but you can see the individual subatomic particles that are in the nucleus, which are the protons and the neutrons. Now, the electron cloud on the outside, that's where the electrons are. And the electrons are actually orbiting that nucleus in the center, traveling around it. Look a bit, little bit closer at the nucleus of an atom. So atomic nucleus contains of what we call nucleons. So a nucleon is just another word for protons and neutrons together, because that's what's in the nucleus, are just the protons and the neutrons. So the overall charge of the nucleus is positive, because we said that protons have a positive charge, and neutrons have a neutral charge. So since the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, you could see that the center, the nucleus, is positively charged. Due to this positively charged center, the electrons are attracted to it because opposites attract, and that's why they orbit around the nucleus. Here's kind of a summary of those charges and also the masses of the three subatomic particles contained in an atom. So we have the proton, which we said was located in the nucleus, and it had a plus one charge. Now the actual mass of a proton is 1.00727. For our purposes, we're just going to round that to a whole number and say the mass is one. Neutrons, the other subatomic particle located in the nucleus, have a charge of zero. They're neutral. Their mass, we're also going to round to just a whole number and give it one. Now for electrons, electrons are present in that electron cloud surrounding the nucleus. So they are outside of the nucleus. They have a negative one charge is why they're orbiting the nucleus, that positively charged center. Now their mass is relatively small, it's 0 0.00055. So since it's so small, we say it's negligible. And when we're calculating mass of atoms, we're going to count the electrons as having a mass of zero, so they're not going to count towards our mass measurements. Now let's look at the elements. So atoms, which we've just discussed, are made up of three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And atoms themselves make up elements. So when we're looking at elements on the periodic table, they're represented by atomic symbols. And not all atomic symbols make sense for the name of that element in English. For instance, um, sodium is represented by the symbol Na. And the reason it's represented by the symbol Na and not S or SO is because the symbol came from the Latin word natrium. Tungsten has something similar. It's represented by the symbol, symbol W for Wolfram in Swedish. Just be aware when you're trying to find some of these elements on the periodic table that the symbol doesn't always match up with the name itself. Looking at atomic number, so on the periodic table, elements are represented by a symbol, which we just discussed on the previous slide. So in this top example, the symbol would be C for carbon. What else is represented on the periodic table is the atomic number. And the atomic number is usually represented as a whole number above the symbol. So in this top case, it would be six for carbon. Now that number six, that atomic number, actually represents the number of protons in carbon atoms. So that means all carbon atoms have six protons. If you change the number of atoms, or if you change the number of protons, excuse me, you're actually changing the identity of the element itself. So let's look at the second example. In the second example, we have molybdenum, represented with the chemical symbol MO. 
Now the atomic number is the whole number above the symbol, 42. So what this means is molybdenum has 42 protons. So all atom, atoms of molybdenum will have 42 protons. If you change the number of protons, you're changing the identity of the element itself. Next, let's look at mass number. So mass number is a number that's not represented on the periodic table. And we're going to calculate this by adding the protons and the neutrons together. Because remember that per table that we looked at previously, protons were worth one atomic mass unit and neutrons were also worth one atomic mass unit. So if we know the number of protons and neutrons, we can just add those together to get the total mass number. Let's look at some calculations involving the mass numbers. So in this example, we're going to determine the mass number of an iodine atom that has 73 neutrons. Well, notice they gave us the number of neutrons, but we just said on the previous slide that for mass, we need the neutrons and the protons. So how do we figure out the number of protons? Well, what we would do is we would look up iodine on the periodic table, because remember, the number of protons is represented on the periodic table right above the element symbol. So looking at iodine, its atomic number is 53, which means its number of protons is 53. So to solve for the mass number, we would take 53, the number of protons, and add it to 73, the number of neutrons. Remember, we don't need to know the number of electrons because since their mass is so small, it doesn't count toward the total mass number. So adding the protons to the neutrons, we get a total mass number of that particular iodine atom at 126. Let's try a few more. So in these three examples, we are given the subatomic particles. So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now remember, when you're trying to calculate mass, the electrons aren't going to count towards mass. So you want to ignore that last piece of information. So to solve for each one of these, you're simply going to add the protons to the neutrons for each one. So in the first one, we have 13 plus 14, which should give us a total of 27. 37 for the next, and 56 for the last one. So why are we counting mass numbers? How is that important? Well, mass numbers are important when we're looking at isotopes. So to define an isotope, isotopes are atoms of the same element that differ in mass number. So for instance, we looked at an example of iodine atoms and we calculated the mass number of a particular iodine atom. Well, all iodine atoms are going to have the same number of protons. That's the atomic number that we saw represented above the element symbol on the periodic table. So if we're talking about iodine, all atoms of iodine will have 53 protons. That's not going to change. However, there can be other atoms of iodine that have a different number of neutrons. And because they have a different number of neutrons, their mass number is going to change. Because remember, mass number is the protons plus the neutrons. So the protons might be changing, being, excuse me, the protons might remain the same but the neutrons could change, which affects that total mass number. So bringing it back to the first modern atomic theory, we said number two, postulate two, was not entirely true. And why is this? It's because of isotopes, actually. So we said all atoms of an element are identical. And we just said, because of isotopes, that all atoms of an element can differ in their mass, meaning they wouldn't be identical. Their mass numbers can be different from one atom to another. Let's look more closely at isotopes. Elements can have multiple isotopes that occur naturally, each with a different number of neutrons. Remember, the number of protons are staying the same. It's the number of neutrons that is changing and making that mass number different. 
So here's an example of isotopes of neon. There are three different isotopes of neon, neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. So with how they're written, we have the element name, and then after the dash, the number that comes after the dash, that's their mass number. So neon 20 would have a mass number of 20. Neon 21 would have a mass number of 21, so on and so forth. So if we wanted to calculate the number of protons and neutrons in each of those isotopes, the protons would be the same for each one of those. For all three of those isotopes, it would be the number of neutrons that would differ. So looking at an example, neon 20, it would have 10 protons because the atomic number of neon is 10, just like all the other isotopes of neon, but it's the neutrons that change. To figure out the number of neutrons, we just need to figure out what plus 10 is going to equal that mass number. The isotopes represented occur in a certain abundance. So notice we said that mass number was not represented on the periodic table. The number that is represented on the periodic table is the average atomic mass, and that's a decimal point, not a whole number. So for neon, the average atomic mass is 20.19. And the reason, or how they calculate that, is by taking all three isotopes of neon and their abundance and calculating out the average atomic mass of all atoms of neon. So how are isotopes found and how is the abundance counted? So how do we come up with that average atomic mass? They actually use what is called a mass spectrometer and this separates atoms by differing masses and since it's separating um, based off of their mass it's actually isolating the isotopes. It can give the relative abundance by counting each isotope at that mass in the sample. So looking a little bit closer at how a mass spectrometer works. You have a sample of neon, for instance, and it's hit by an ion beam. When that ion beam hits it, it actually knocks some of the electrons off of the atom, making the atoms positive. Remember, electrons are negatively charged particles, so if we knock any of those off, it's going to make the atom an overall positive charge. Having this positively charged ion now, those atoms go through a magnet. Now, this magnet is curved. In this magnetic field, what it does is it actually separates all of those atoms based off of their mass. So around the inside of the curve is where the lowest mass atoms are going to curve to. The outside of the curve is where the highest mass atoms are going to gravitate towards. There's a sensor at the end of the magnet that counts the atoms as they come out. So the ones that went the shortest path would come out first, and those would be the lowest mass atoms. The ones that went the longest path around the outside of the curve would be the heaviest and would be counted last. So once you have the sample go through the magnet, what you get out is a mass spectrum that looks kind of like the picture here, where we have mass number on the x-axis and the ion beam intensity on the right. So how they calculate the abundance is they actually take the area underneath each of these peaks. You can see there's a peak at 20, and that's the largest peak on this spectrum. And there's a reason for that. When you look at neon 20, its abundance is 90%. What that means is 90.6% of all neon atoms have a mass number of 20. There are two other peaks, but they're very small. You can see a tiny, tiny peak at 21, which accounts for this neon 21 isotope. And notice the abundance on that. It's only 0.26%, barely a blip, which makes sense when you see the peak itself with how tiny it is. A slightly larger peak at the 22 mark represents the neon 22 isotope with a 9% abundance. Averaging these out give you an average atomic mass for neon of 20.19. Here's just a cutout of some other isotopes um, that you'll find in a table in your OpenStax books.
you'll notice that almost all elements have isotopes to them. Beryllium would be one exception. So notice beryllium just has one isotope, but all others have two, possibly three, some even four different isotopes. So isotopes are represented in two different ways. We've seen one way so far, and that first way that we've explored is where we have the element name and then a dash with the mass number coming after the dash. So an example would be carbon-12. This 12 is saying that the mass number of that particular isotope is 12. The other way to represent isotopes is using a nuclide symbol, and that's what we see in this white box off to the right. So in a nuclide symbol, we write the element symbol from the periodic table. So in the case of carbon, we would use the letter C. And the number in the upper left-hand corner is the mass number. So in this case, 12 would be the mass number of that carbon isotope. The number below, that's the atomic number or the number of protons. This number is sometimes omitted when we write a nuclide symbol because we could find out the atomic number simply by looking up carbon on the periodic table. So let's calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons using some nuclide symbols. So here we have a nuclide symbol of chlorine. Now remember, this number in the upper left-hand corner, that's the mass number of that particular isotope. This number 17 is the atomic mass number, or the number of protons, I should say. So using this nuclide symbol, 17 represents the number of protons. So that makes that part easy. For the number of neutrons, we're actually going to take the mass number and subtract the number of protons from it. So it's kind of nice when we're using a nuclide symbol to calculate the neutrons because they have it set up for us. They have the mass number of 35 in the upper left-hand corner. So all we need to do is add a subtraction sign right here. And to figure out the number of neutrons, we take 35 minus 17. Mass number minus protons. To figure out the number of electrons, well, all of the isotopes that we're going to be exploring are going to be neutral. What that means is they're not going to have a charge. So if there is no charge, the protons equal the electrons. And we know this because protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. So in order for that overall atom to be neutral, the positives and negatives have to cancel each other out. So if I have 17 protons, that must mean that I have 17 electrons. Let's look at another example. So here's another nuclide symbol representing an isotope of magnesium. So we have a mass number of 26, and then they give us the atomic number of 12. The atomic number is the number of protons. Since it's a neutral molecule, that means we also have 12 electrons. To calculate the number of neutrons, simply subtract the mass number of 26 minus the number of protons of 12 to get a total of 14 neutrons. So here are some examples. So we're going to determine the mass and identity of an atom with the following particle counts and write the nuclide symbol. So remember, when we're writing the nuclide symbol, we're going to use the form where we have X representing the element symbol. In the top left corner will be the mass number. And then in the bottom left corner will be the number of protons. So using the particle counts given for problems one and two, we can write the nuclide symbols and figure out what element it is. So for the first problem, to figure out what element we're talking about, we're going to look at the number of protons. Because the number of protons defines the element. When you're looking at a particular element, the number of protons is always going to be the same for all atoms of that element. It's the electrons and neutrons that can change. So to figure out what element we're looking at, we would look up number 82 on the periodic table 
Finding number 82, it looks like that is lead with the symbol PB. So in place of where X is on that nuclide symbol, we would write PB. 82, since that's the number of protons, would go in the bottom left-hand corner. And then to figure out the mass number, we would take the number of protons, which is 82, and add it to the number of neutrons, which in this case is 125. So add those together, whatever you get, that is the mass number going in the upper left-hand corner. The electrons are given here just to throw you off. They don't change the mass number at all. They don't change what the element is, the identity of the element, and they don't change the number of protons. For number two, go through the same process. To figure out what element you're talking about, you look at the number of protons. So in this case, it's 50. So look up number 50 on your periodic table, and that will give you the identity of the element. Then to figure out the mass number, you want to take those 50 protons and add it to the number of neutrons, which in this case is 119. We'll see the answers written out to these problems on the next slide. Now let's look at the next section. Next section is asking us how many neutrons are in the following elements. So for number one, it tells us that we have a sodium atom with a mass number of 23. So to figure out the number of neutrons, we need to take the mass number and subtract the number of protons from the mass number. That will give us the number of neutrons. So the mass number itself is given to us in the question itself. It tells us that the mass number is 23. To figure out the number of protons, since it's not given to us, we would need to look that up on the periodic table. So where do you find that? Look up the sodium atom, and what number is the sodium atom? So it's in the first group, it's an alkali metal, and it's number 11. So that means that sodium has 11 protons. So to figure out the number of neutrons, you take the mass number of 23 and subtract the number of protons, which, since it's sodium, is 11. And I apologize, the writing looks sloppy <laughs> uh, due to writing with a mouse here. Now for number two, we have a carbon atom. So we're going to use the fact that it's carbon to figure out the number of protons. So same steps. The mass number is given to us. In this case, it's 14. So you would, to figure out the neutrons, you would take that mass number of 14 and subtract the number of protons that all carbon atoms have. And I believe it's six. That's correct, it is six. Now the last problem doesn't tell us the identity of the element. It just says an element with the atomic number of five and mass number of 11. So the atomic number is the same thing as the number of protons. So it's telling us the element that they're talking about is element number five. And element number five is boron. So to figure out the number of neutrons, we would take the mass number of 11, subtract the atomic number of 5, which is the number of protons, and that will give us our neutrons, which in that case would be 6. So here on this slide, you can see we have um, the mass numbers of the first two problems solved, the calculation shown, and then the identity of the elements as well.